sometimes, and I've talked to different ones over the years, sometimes I get a little bit, what's the word, devious in my selecting a title for a message to try to mislead everybody so they have to listen to find out why I chose that title. This week, it's, it's in the stars. I heard something here a while back about the recent couple of years we've had a lot of things going on with this COVID-19 and our people are still somewhat obsessed with this thing. And, and it shut us down for a while, caused all kind of crazy things to go in, in the world around us, and especially here in this country. That's what we're uh, aware of more than anything, what's happen happening to us, all the shutdowns and everything. And I was watching a news program here recently, and, and sometimes they just have little tidbits of news just scrolling across the bottom of the screen. And something caught my attention and then started this whole process of putting this message together today. And it said that there was a 30% increase during a COVID-19 thing, talking about 2020 and 21, there was a 30% increase in the activity with astrology and horoscopes. And I said, what caused that now? And I started looking and doing a little research and it don't take very long. One thing I looked up was to see how much money was spent on the horoscope each year, even though I've known this has been a problem for a long time. And I, I call it a problem because too many people are wrapped up in stuff that doesn't have too much to do with their salvation. And it said, in this one report, in the United States each year, well, this year, or this past year of 21, $10 million was spent in the United States on horoscope. People calling their astrologists and getting their reading for the day. 2.2 billion worldwide the same year. Money spent on this. Calling your personal reader or your astrologist calling your time watcher, because that's what horoscope means, time watcher. And signs of the times that we know about in the scriptures is not the same thing as what people are looking at when they're looking at the stars. How the stars line up, the planets on any given time during the year, and sometimes there's a cycle of years goes by, certain planets and stars line up a certain way, and they, people believe that there's some kind of influence for their personal life in all of that. And they would even tell you, it's in the stars for me today for this or that, or it's not in the stars. And so I'm not going to drive on this street today because it's in the stars that something might happen. And I've often thought about this, and, and I wondered many times how people could be taken in by this when there's no credible reason for them to be looking at the stars to find out how their life should be led. But... Two questions were asked during the, the virus, two years, 20 and 21. First question that was asked, number one question, am I going to get the virus? The next question was, am I going to die from this virus? I thought that was a bit extreme, that somebody would ask another person to read the stars for them and find out if they were going to die. And now, maybe we could say, well, that's how absurd this thing is, but people have absolutely become very serious about this. So now we have the world, and we've known this for a long time, that the world is somewhat obsessed with fortune telling, crystal balls and readings and soothsayers, prognosticators. These are all biblical words. Mediums, witches, readers, psychics, and there's all kind of ologies out there. Some think that, you know, knowledge is a science, but it's actually a study of something. Astrology is being one of the greatest things that's out there now. It's, it's an obsession with people, astrology is, with all the sorcerers and everything that are in there. And you could classify false prophets in this category, too, because the Bible has a lot to say about that. And I wondered about whether or not it was necessary for me to say anything about this. But then I started just researching what the Bible has to say in opposition to this kind of activity. I realized the Bible is packed full of information about what God says about this. And it's interesting that people would be 
wrapped up in ghosts and werewolves and contacting the dead and getting hold of their medium. And, and we were told years ago that near this time where we're in right now, that this whole concept, everything is under a thing called spiritualism, that it would increase before Jesus came. And we're seeing that now. And I, just looking at the research that I did just in the past few weeks, it's very evident to me that this has definitely increased. And it's more so now. And it's, and it's spread into all kinds of different things in our world today. Still trying to understand how people believe that looking at the stars and the position of a planet here or there in its orbit around the sun has anything to do with their life. But people really believe this, and it's, it's worldwide. I remember looking at some things in the years past. I, I used to love astronomy, and, and this is a real science if it's done right. And even in astronomy, this stuff is there. And even in cosmology or archaeology, all of this concept of people thinking some supernatural thing other than God is in this. And they really believe it. What was interesting to me is I was watching a documentary when they put the, y'all know this, about the Hubble telescope that was put in orbit. They used the shuttles to put it up there, and they had to go up with the shuttle and repair the lens on that thing. And they, they were trying to get to where they could look back into space a little deeper. And they saw some wonderful things. And what they found out, and I heard one uh, person that was on this documentary say, we have more questions now than we did before. Because they kept looking in the, and there's a program on Science Channel on TV, and I watch it once in a while. And I'm, I'm okay, I hope my discerning mind is going to let me know, but what they're saying can't be proven. The title of it is How the Universe Works. All these suppositions and things that they say, it's absolutely ridiculous to me to hear them say these things. And when they don't have any proof for some of the stuff they say, how is it that I can prove what's way out there thousands and thousands, hundreds of thousands of light years away in space, and they think they understand it? And we can't even get there. We're just seeing an image of it somehow on a telescope. Of course, now we have another telescope up there. I think the Hubble is kind of winding down. We have satellites looking at everything on the Earth and all of this, and people are looking at it for some reason. And they're trying to understand something. And one thing that caught my attention, and I've heard it two or three different times, with the Hubble, they was asked, the narrator of this documentary I was watching said, I asked the man, he says, what are you looking for? The guy just got a little silent there for a moment, and I've shared this before. Kind of looked down, and he looked up, and he says, we're trying to find out where we came from. But see, that tells, them, tells me something about these so-called scientists, astronomers, and whatever. They're all mixed up. There's a, quite a difference between what they think they understand and what God says and what the Bible teaches about creation and all. Of course, they believe that now there's a big portion of these scientists, so-called scientists, you might call them, that are looking for some evidence that we came from outer space and started with some little thing that happened in a mud hole somewhere. You know, and, and that's, you, us as people that have studied a little bit of science of our own, that sounds so ridiculous that you want to cry almost. Of course, we believe in what the Bible says. Hopefully, that's going to stay with us. And recently... We've got some billionaires in the world that are getting into space travel. The one that caught my attention more than anyone was Elon Musk. It's the SpaceX program, and he's the one that you know, started the Tesla car factory. And so he's planning on, in the next five years, to put someone on Mars. Colonize, not so much colonize it yet, but just to go out there. And I'm wondering in my mind many times, I said, why would God allow man to do that, to take what he's ruined here and then take it up there and try to get on Mars? And, and the amount of energy and money and all that would be spent to go to Mars is still unbelievable to me. And I'm telling you all this to get to a point. Another thing that caught my attention back in the 60s, I guess it was, I don't know if any of you in here are old enough to remember a program called Cosmos that was on TV back in the 60s. Maybe it went into the 70s. It was shared several times. There was a 13-part series called Cosmos. The man that was narrating was Carl Sagan. He was a, a, an astronomer. He died of cancer when he was 38 years old. 
But he said one time on that program, and I, and I never will forget it to this day. He said, we're nothing but stardust. We came from outer space. And that was maybe a point in our modern times that this thing got started about believing that we came from outer space in, a, in that sense. And considering what he said, it's in the mindset of many of our astronomers and cosmologists today that if we came from there, maybe we can go back. You know, and that, that's where some of this stuff has generated all this activity in, in space travel and whatever. But I found out after years of looking into this, too many people are worshiping at a throne of speculation, worshiping at the throne of evolution, worshiping at the throne of self and theory instead of worshiping the God who created everything. And that's where I got the idea to put this together. It's not in the stars for me. It's in this book. And I've known it for a long time. And I'm not going to ever apologize about this. But one of these people that believe in all this so supposed scientific stuff that they've dreamed up or supposedly researched and come up with these theories, they would never, their ego would never let them read a certain text in the Bible. Let's look at Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Revelation 14. Very interesting thing to me, and we as Seventh-day Adventists know what this is all about. Proclamation of the three angels' messages here. Just a couple of verses here, and this is the first angel here, the one that John records. He says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, even the astrologist, even the scientist, it's to everyone to hear this, to everyone, every nation, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory. I'm going to emphasize this, my own emphasis. Give glory to him for the hour of his, his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and the springs of water. This came in a one sense from outer space, what we would think is wherever God is from his throne, he spoke everything into existence. And here we have it, a mystery to us in, in, in a scientific standpoint, but it was God who made this statement. This is taking us back to his creation story. God did this. It wasn't something that happened, you know, and of course, if you know anything about some of these ideas about the big bang and whatever, you can really get taken in by a lot of crazy thoughts here so-called things that mankind is coming up with. And I think this is interesting for us to look at too. Look at this. Worship God, not the objects of his creation, not my theories or anything like that. We don't worship the earth, the sun, the moon, the stars. We don't worship the influences of planets and stars, where they are in the lining up this way or that way. We don't even worship the influence that we think they have. That's not God's plan. He, he, he detests this kind of stuff. But the ego and philosophy of man has got in the way of this. But where did all of this idea come from? Where did it start? Do we have any evidence in history that tells us how this all got started? It's been around for so long. It goes all the way back when we look at the, the horoscope and looking at the stars thinking about the influence they have. Where did that originally come from? And I thought this was interesting, and I knew this for a long time, but I did a little more research and went a little deeper into it in the last few weeks. And it's very evident that this is how this came in our culture here today. The Greeks, let's go back a little further, go back to the Babylonians. They were some masterful people in mathematics and stuff in science and all. And maybe some of those people in that category of stuff, they were smarter than some of us are today because they put together some things that we have in our scientific stuff now. They were the ones that gave us the 360 degree circle. I often wondered about that. I looked it up a long time ago. What they did, they divided the heavens, what we call the heavens, the rotation of the earth around the sun every year, the constellations that are up there these stars in the position they are on any given year. 
in the circle of a year's time, 365 days that we ended up with in our calendar, and they had a little something to do with that, I think, the original calendars and all that they had. They watched the sun and the moon and the stars, and they calculated some things. They divided this rotation of the earth around the sun into 360 degrees. They broke that down into 12 sections of 30 degrees each, making the 360 degrees. And that's where we got the 12 signs of the zodiac was from them. The Greeks added to that and put the names of their gods in there later on. And now people will come up to you on the street even and ask you, what sign were you born under? And they said, over the building where I was born, it said Mercy Hospital. That was a sign up there where I was born, you know, and down in Charlotte. But some people look at this as a, you know, an important thing. And I had to be told when I, after I was an adult that, you know, I was under the sign of Taurus, the bull, you know, and I didn't even pay any attention. I still don't know how all that works, but it's, it's, it's foolishness to me. But there's always a however or a but at the end of this whole thing, making statements like this. God of heaven didn't give us this to follow. We know about keeping time and all of that. It was God himself who gave us time. And he said, I've got some laws I want you to follow, standards I want you to go by. I don't want you looking at the stars and trying to find out how your life is influenced. I want you to follow the standards that I'm giving you. You want to manage your life. There's a standard I'm giving you. And we all know here in this room that Exodus 20, God makes a statement to the Israelites after he brought them out of Egypt. He says, I am the one that brought you out. You shall have no other gods before me. And then the second thing he said, the second commandment was, you shall not make images to them, you shall not bow down to them, you shall not worship them. But mankind has been doing this a long time. These commandments are repeated again by Moses in chapter 5 of Deuteronomy, if you want to read that. Making sure that we understand it. Two places in the Bible that list these commandments. God making sure that we understand the very premier thing he's got in his commandments, you shall have no other gods before me. Bible says that God is a jealous God. He looks at his creatures out here, his, the premier creature that he created, mankind, and he sees people doing some of these things, and he, he's very jealous of the fact that you're worshiping something of his creation instead of him, and that would make him jealous. Not in a bad way, but God is looking at it from a standpoint this is disappointing that man went this far and is not worshiping me. We have this written record in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And I've shared this many times with people in Bible studies and prayer meeting here and other places. We've talked about it. What it says in Genesis 1, if you read it there in that chapter, I didn't count them exactly and write the number down, but how many different ways it says in that first chapter that God made, God said, God created, God blessed, God saw. All these statements that are made in, in the first chapter. And he said all these things that he did was good. And then when he created man, he said it's very good because we're supposed to be created in his image, not to be worshiping creation, but worshiping him. It's an amazing thought when you look at it like that. I never did count them. But someone I saw this on the internet a long time ago. Maybe it wasn't the first time I saw it in a book, maybe. 3,800 times, more than 3,800 times in the Bible, the term, thus says God, or as it says in the King James Version, thus saith the Lord. 3,800 times in the Bible. The people that were inspired by him to write the Bible, they thought that was significant every time they heard were inspired to write what God said, they put that in there. Thus saith the Lord. This is what he says, not what mankind has put in here. This was more or less quoted by the writers of the Bible. Interesting thought to me. Here's another but. But mankind has not paid any attention to most of this. For the most part, man has not paid attention to this. And we have something 
we were kind of drifted toward that in Sabbath school this morning. There's a thing called pantheism in our world. The prefix in that word pan means it's worldwide. It's way out. It's everywhere. And you look at all the crazy, maybe false religions that are in the world today, they would fall in some place under that whole title, pantheism. And the point of it being, people have adopted this thing and they believe, and there's who knows out of the 8 billion people in the world, how many people out there worship something of God's creation and not him, and they don't even realize they're doing it. And maybe even in some spin off some Christianity, people are doing some of this. They're thinking, and the general concept would be here if you wanted to, to define what pantheism is. It's believing that the universe itself and everything in it is God. Instead of there being a supreme creator on his throne somewhere that did all of this. And it goes into all kinds of crazy things. And if we didn't know it already, God is not in everything. He's on his throne somewhere in the universe. I don't know how to rightly understand all of that. And one day that's going to change according to what we understand. God is going to be here on this earth ruling the universe, the Bible teaches. But God is not in everything, but he created everything. And some people worship things that are in the earth and on the earth 96 particular natural elements that are here on this earth, the human body has most of them in it. That's what keeps us going. We're created out of the elements that God created. And anything beyond that understanding that we're created by him and we're required by him to follow certain rules, this is what God is expecting of us. And anything beyond that is called idolatry in the Bible. Idolatry has another one of these words that just covers all kinds of things. Anything that we put in the place of God can be an idol to us if we're not careful. And we have to know this. I know you've heard of Mother Earth and Mother Nature. Some of this weird stuff has spun off into those terms. Pantheism. God is the universe. God is anything that you see in nature, in it or of it. And man has seen fit to create some level of worship to satisfy this longing for this, and I can do it whenever and however I want to. And that's what man has, why this is so crazy, because God forbids this activity. He does. He really forbids this. This was another one of these little things that spun across the bottom of the screen. I saw it here just a few weeks ago. They had a survey out that said that 20% of the people that were surveyed, they asked the question, do you believe the Bible is the word of God? 20% said, no, they did not believe. I don't know who these people were. If there were Christians in there, shame on them. If there was some other people, maybe we could say shame on them too. But you have to really understand this book to really believe it. You have to dig and look and search and pray and God will reveal himself in this book. He really does. But the elements on the earth are made up, make up the stone and the metal and the wood and the flesh that's on this earth. And people are taking these items and making for them a God, molding this thing, shaping it. And you can read about it everywhere in the Bible. People have, are doing this, making an idol with their own hands and holding this thing, rubbing this thing, and bowing down to it and worshiping it. And they have shrines and altars and things in their homes. And they do this type of activity. But this is the kind of stuff that God forbids in his word. And we need to be really careful. And we, Andy, I appreciate him getting up here and reading that whole psalm. And I had that in there. And we, you know, the first verse in, in the and that psalm says, the heavens declare the glory of God, not of some man or something. The heavens declare God's glory. He's the creator. Talks about the sun there making its orbit around them. You know, people are able to take what's out there, the stars, the planets, and all the rotation around in our solar system, and we actually set our clocks by this. 
is so accurate, so consistent, we can set our clocks back. And if everyone wants to change the atomic clock that we have on the earth, they use the cosmos to check and see if they're right. They had to readjust our clock just here recently. It's in, been in my lifetime. They had to adjust our clock one-tenth of a second because it was off. And they used the stars and the orbits and all of that to do that. Now that takes some powerful creative intelligence to be able to make something that consistent. To me it does. I don't see how it could have just happened the way it is. The heavens declare this. But what has man done to God's creation? If the heavens declare this, what has man done to this? I want to read a text here. And it's in Romans chapter 1. You've heard this one before, but I'm going to read it again today. I used to stagger when I would read this. It's in Romans chapter 1, verse 18 through 25 is what I'm going to read. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And then it starts here in verse 19. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. God is not going to leave us devoid of knowing who he is. He's going to try to reach each one of us sometime, somewhere in our life. Even though we know some things, we drift away from it, and we go out on our own, and we start thinking all these weird things. For God has shown it to them in the last part of verse 19. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Now, how many of you have a Bible that the end of the verse 25, it's got amen at the end of that thing, or amen. And we say, and the pastor, Scotty, he gets up here and says, but somebody say amen, you know, that calls for an amen. When you make a statement like this, Paul thought it was time to say amen to this. I mean, this is where our world is today. Really, it is. It's a staggering thought to realize that people would change God's creation. It was supposed to be a beautiful thing that God did. And they changed it into a corruptible thing. But God is incorruptible. And we need to recognize him like that. It cannot be destroyed or anything. People that know God, but at the same time go into these areas of disbelief and start worshiping the creature rather than the creator, his creation. And this goes on all the time in, in our world today. False religions in our world, and we could actually call this theory, which is just a supposition or some philosophy, this theory that they call evolution is actually a secular religion anymore, as some people have made this statement and people worship through this thing called evolution and so there's a battle going on a great controversy going on between good and evil between creation and evolution and it's so dominant in our culture now evolution is we can't even hardly conduct schools anymore without having this thing bombard us from every angle but God says this is not right 1 John chapter 2 this text has been around for a while and a long time. Been in my Bible. Every Bible I've picked up has this verse in it. <laughs> it's the same as it's always been. If your Bible is two, three hundred years old, it still has this verse in here. The Apostle John, the Revelator, he says this in verse 15, John chapter, 1 John chapter 2. Do not love the world or the things in the world. 
If anyone loves the world, the love of God, the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, and then the, the word world here is talking about where the stuff that humanity is involved with. It's not talking about the planet itself. It's talking about culture and society and all of this. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, we could spend two weeks just on these verses right here talking, and many messages could come out of this. The point here being, this is the things that, if you look at those three things, that's what's wrong with our world. The big one here would be pride. Pride is an ugly word. That's the one to where if you started getting too much pride as the children, as I was trying to share with the children this morning, when you certain crazy things come out of your mouth as a young child and your mother would grab you back in my day and would say, let's we'll wash your mouth out with soap, boy. And, and I actually saw that where mother took a bar of soap and took a toothbrush and done a, lathered up and got down in her boy's mouth and cleaned his mouth out. You know, because he said something ugly. And you don't do your parents like that because God had a commandment for that. And that was something back in my day, whenever that day was. That's a long time ago. But he says further in verse 17, the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. I never will forget this, a statement that I heard many years ago, a writer that we all love, and I wouldn't even have to mention her name and you'd know who I'm talking about. She says, you will never be wrong if you do what God says. It's a wonderful thought because everything he's asking us to do is good. It's in our best interest to, to have a kingdom forever, to be eternal with him. That's a good thing. It's really a good thought to have that in our heart. But mankind doesn't seem to want this. So what is it in the world, all that is in the world? When we think it, we can make a long list of things that people have become obsessed with and ended up being in the form of idolatry and has become someone's God. What about houses? What about cars? You know, I've heard people say, boy, I'd love to have one of those new uh, Lexus cars or whatever. Maybe a Lamborghini this time. They're only $300,000. I might have loved to have one you know, and all this kind of stuff. And people don't believe it. In some sense, they are obsessed with this. And people are. I, at one time I was, and of course, y'all, I've shared this story many times, I guess, here, beating on a dead horse, as they say, keep sharing this. But this is significant for me. I worked on this car that I have in my shop now. This it's, car is in Loretta's name, so it's her car. Or to blame her if we got any questions about this. And I restored this car. It took me over a year to do it. I had it in my shop all those years. It's still in my shop. And somebody said, why are you wasting all of that time to redo that car? And I said, it was keeping me occupied, with, you know, some fun things to do, and I wanted to do it. After I got that car cranked up and it was ready to put on the road, this thought just flooded my mind there for a couple of days around that time. And it was in my thoughts. You know that car burns up just like everything else when God comes. You know, it's going to be melt down with fervent heat, Peter said. Kind of put things in perspective when you think about it like that. But some people are obsessed to the point that they think they have to have everything and anything. And they're in a frenzy to get as many as they can. And the big one probably is money. Houses and cars and lands. Prestige, maybe. Power. Any of these can be a god to us. So we've got to be careful about this. One thing that came out of all this with me was this text that I heard many, many years ago. And it's in Timothy, 1 Timothy 6, if you want to look at that. I'm trying to, I put some markers in my Bible this time so I wouldn't have to fumble with these thin pages. But this is in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And you've heard this before. It says, and he, Paul is writing to his protege, Timothy, and giving him some advice. He said, now, godliness with contentment is great gain. Maybe start that off, start this thought off with that. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. How many have ever heard that before in your life? Before you even read the Bible, I've heard it quoted. 
and having food and clothing with these, we should be content. Now, I would like to have more than just food and clothing, but those are the only two things you really need is food and water and a place to get out of the weather. The animals do that, and we're just as alive as they are if that's all we have. He said, we should be content with that. But I like a roof over my head, I really do. You know, and it's consistent, and, but many times we embellish on too many different things, and we have more than what we need. But then he says this in verse nine, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. Quoting this verse here, to make sure we understand, but anything like this can be a God to us. If, if, if our idea is to get rich as we can, it can get us in real trouble. Many things can happen to us. And then this one, verse 10, this is one I used to hear when I was a small child. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, which some, not everyone that has money is not greedy or whatever, but some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Can't take it with you. He just said that. And people grieve themselves on their deathbed because they found out that they've got to leave their gold Cadillac behind and all these things. We've heard all of this before, and I've seen story after story about people that were disappointed on their deathbed because of this. And that's a, quite a sorrow when you're grieving about what you lost, what you gained on this earth, and it's gone now because you're going to die. It's not a good thing for mankind to have to go through this. But Paul says something else, and it's in Romans chapter 12. Let's turn back to that in the Bible. The goat may go along with this. Chapter 12 of Romans. And some of these verses here, I've, I've remembered what they say, and I can quote them and all that, but I'm reading them right out of the Bible so you know that I'm not trying to pull a fast one on you here today. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, you know that verse, don't you? By the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Does a person that's trying to get rich quick, is he like this? You present your body to God as a living sacrifice? They don't think about anything like that. What is your lifestyle like? Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And then this one, verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You have to let God renew your mind so you will prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. This has been there the whole time. We have to read it and accept it into our life. This is what God wants. Difference between transformed and conformed. Transformed means you're moving and doing something. That's a verb. Conformed it means you're stuck in the mud. You're just there. God wants us to move. This world is passing away. It's going away quickly as we notice what's happening in the world today. And to people that think they got some specific thing that they can do in their life that is worship to them, it's disappointing because they never get transformed. They're stuck in their mud. We were in prayer meeting here recently and Pastor Scotty, he went over Romans, I mean not Romans, but John chapter 4 talking about the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. One verse in there that was always catching my attention was verse 24 where he says, you're not going to worship God out here on this mountain or anywhere else. You worship God in spirit and in truth. You know, and that's what's coming. That's what we're going to do in the new earth, I believe, if that makes any sense. But we must look for him. And I believe this woman at the well was looking for him, looking for the Messiah when she came there. He may have not known it, but she was looking for something. And you have to do it when he is near. And Jesus was very near her there at that well at that time. And we have to accept him. Isaiah 55 says, call upon him while he is near in Isaiah 55. We need to do that. And God is always trying to save us. He's not willing that any should perish. He's waiting on each one of us. And in those moments when he's talking to our spirit that's supposed to be inside of us, allowing him to be with us, that's when he's near. 
And today is the moment of salvation when that happens, when you know that God is near you. I don't know how many times that's happened to me in the middle of the night and in moments where I felt like, okay, I'm having trouble in my life here, maybe not in my marriage or anything, but stuff is not, I don't feel good today. And God comforts you. That's when he's near. That's when you make your choices, those good choices in life. And in that sense, it's real easy to listen to God because he's coming to you. You don't have to try to look for him. He's right there. But he's always near in that sense. So, yes, the world has its idols. And it's had them for millennia. God didn't always like this. He never did like this. And he says it in his word that it's foolishness to have idols because you look at the activity that man gets involved with, all the things, the crazy things that he does to try to think that he's worshiping God and, and this is his salvation, it's through this. He's always disappointed because he keeps moving forward with this and he never is satisfied. I'm going to read our scripture reading that Jaden read. I'm going to read that again. And... I'm giving you for homework. I like to do this. I was a teacher in the Navy, and I used to give everybody homework to read for the next session. Read chapter 43 and 44 of Isaiah in one sitting. Just read it straight through, and hopefully some of this stuff that I'm sharing today will come out of that. But what's interesting about this to me is the idea that Isaiah was given a prophecy, the gospel prophet, I want to bring something out of here that he gave to us. This is Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 8. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and the last, where we get this term Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Beside me there is no God. If you didn't know it already, there is no other God beside this one that's in this book. There is no other God. And who can proclaim as I do? Then let him declare it and set it in order for me. Since I appointed the ancient people and the things that are coming and shall come, let them show these to them. Do not fear nor be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and declared it? And then he says this, you are my witnesses. And if sometimes you, when you read this yourself, you say, Maybe that should have said when I'm reading it personally, it would say, you are my witness, Melvin, or Pedro, or Chuck, or anybody. You are my witness to this because your life can show this. Is there a God beside me? Question mark. Indeed, there is no other rock. And this word rock in my Bible is capitalized. Rock. I know not one. Interesting thought to hang on to that. There's another verse that goes maybe go along with that. And I'm going to read a couple of verses out of chapter 43 here just quickly. And, and I was, maybe it was Chuck I was talking to earlier here this week, talking about, you know, doing more messages, taking us verses and doing a narrative on it as we're sharing. And this maybe is some of that. I never was one to just take and go through a whole section of Scripture and just share every little thing that comes out of there. But so much comes out of this, maybe I need to start doing it, Brother Chuck. Wonderful thought here. It's in Isaiah chapter 43. And, and I want to look at uh, probably just 8 through 13 here. See if this catches your attention about anything you've read somewhere else. Bring out the blind people who have eyes. You know, there are blind people that have eyes, but they can't see. But there are other people that have eyes that can see, but they really don't see. And this is kind of where I've led with these thoughts here. And the deaf who have ears, let all the nations be gathered together and let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us former things? Let them bring out their witnesses that they may be justified. We hear a lot about witnesses here lately. The, the evolutionists and all trying to bring up a witness how they think everything came into being. But it doesn't make sense to a person that understands his, God's word. Or let them hear and say it is truth. And then he says this again. You are my witnesses. There's three or four times he says that in these flow of verses here. Says the Lord. And my spirit whom I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God form nor shall there be after me. 
Even I am the Lord. And here's a clincher to me. And besides me, there is no savior. If man is looking at creation for his, to be his savior, he needs to read these verses. I have declared and saved. I have proclaimed and there was no foreign God among you. Therefore, you are my witnesses, says the Lord, that I am God. Indeed, before the day was, I am he. And there is no one who can deliver out of my hand. I work, and who will reverse it? Thinking of that, I understand how we came to be on this earth. That doesn't change, doesn't reverse what God has said. Beautiful thoughts in his word. Another text I want you to read, and I, and I see our time waning away here quickly. And if you read the story of Job, and I've read it several times, and I had a text down here for, in chapter 38, verses 1 through 11, where he questions Job, where were you, Job, when I did all of this? Where were you when I created the flood? Where were you when I told the oceans, you just stop right here? You know, global warming people might need to read that verse, thinking about the oceans rising and all that, and God says that's not going to happen. Where were you, Melvin, when I did all of this? I have to take that personally. Where were you when I did everything? You cannot challenge him if you recognize what he's saying in his word. You cannot ref refute what he has declared in his word. You cannot do it. And so to answer another question that maybe has come up out of all of this, and the answer is no, salvation is not in the stars. It's not in the stars. There's no influence about how the planets and stars line up. People are, say it's in the stars for this to happen to me. No, it's not. It's in his word what's going to happen to each one of us, yea or nay for each one of us. You cannot refute that. But Jesus does say in Revelation chapter 2, and this is one of the letters that was written to the church there, are those seven letters in Revelation, the church of Thyatira, we call it, and Jesus actually makes a statement in there in chapter 2, verse 28, that we would be overcomers and he would give us, however, the morning star. He would give us the morning star. And I thought that would be an interesting way to close this today. Our fortune is not in the stars, but it is in a star. And he goes on to say in Revelation 22, and I want us to read this one, Revelation 22, verse 16, in closing here this morning or this afternoon now. One of the last statements in the Bible, in my Bible it's in red, so I know it's Jesus who says this. I, Jesus, have sent my angels to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. It's one of the synonyms or terms that's used to explain who Jesus is. If we're going to worship a star, we worship Jesus. That's the way the Bible refers to this. Another text that helps us understand this, and maybe we need to look at this one right quick, is 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter, James, and John were on the Mount of Transfiguration. You read about it in Matthew 17. They saw what it was going to look like when Jesus came. And God spoke on there and said, this is my son. Moses and Elijah was there with him. And they saw a little taste of what it was going to look like when Jesus came. And Peter said this in his second letter, that he was there. And I'm just going to read verse 19, and 20 through, 19 through 21 here in, in 2 Peter 1. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. That's where the star is supposed to be. This morning star is supposed to be within us through his spirit. That's how it works. So these prophecies that we're reading, the things, the statements that we're seeing in the Bible, it never came by the will of men, but the holy men were moved. They were inspired and moved by the Holy Spirit to do this, to tell us and give us these wonderful things. And, of course, you can read John chapter 1. that goes further with that, and that's part of your homework today, too. In the beginning was the Word. You know what that means. We know that this is Jesus that's talking about, and that's what we need to close on here today. 
The fact that all these statements in God's word comes from the one who created everything, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. That's who, this, who we're supposed to be recognizing here. Well, maybe I need to read one more text before we close. Chapter 25 of Isaiah. I tried to mark all of these where I could find them real quickly. If you want to do some extracurricular activity for homework, you can read 25 and 26 of Isaiah. All this fits together. Gospel prophet. Would you be willing with me today to say this in our heart and accept this thing right here? It says in verse 9 of, Revelation, of Isaiah 25. And it will be said in that day, hopefully by every one of us, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. Jesus, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. And today will each one of us say we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. That's what we need to be thinking here today. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for giving opportunity to understand these things that are in your word, to be able to understand how marvelous and great and powerful with the creative ability that you have to do things the way you have. And Lord, let each one of us understand that your, your son is coming one day. That's the point of your scriptures, to get, us, get our hearts right with you so we'll be that day we're going to come and meet him and look at him and say, we've waited for you, Lord. We're glad you're here. We're going to enjoy the salvation you offer to us. That's what you've been trying to do all the time, Lord. It's a wonderful thought to have when we lie down at night and we think about you, that these things cross our mind when we see things and understand things from this earth that we live on. We have images, there's parabolic things all around us that remind us of this. How wonderful it is, Lord. And so we thank you that you're there. I just pray that there's not one of us here that don't understand what you're trying to do in each one of our hearts, getting us ready for that. But if there is someone in the, in the sound of every one of our voices that doesn't understand us, give us opportunity to, to share with them, Lord, and give them this great hope that we have. It will enhance their day. It will enhance our experience, too, because we see your gospel moving forward in this earth. Let that be the case, Lord, as we leave here today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.